Hello, everyone. Welcome to class eight. Today, we're going to talk about imageability, psychogeography, and embedded narrative. Hmm. There we go. Um, all right. So from the syllabus today, we're uh, the recommended reading is Pattern Language for Game Design, Chapter 9, Embedded Narrative and Environmental Narrative Patterns. Um, we'll be working on those patterns in class, so it will be to your advantage to have read that section. Um, and uh, if you read it, write about it, and you get credit for that. Uh, architectural Approach to Level Design, Chapter 8, uh, which talks about tutorial levels. And then uh, we're going to do a pattern language, picking one pattern, um, as is traditional. Uh, lecture topics today are going to be on imageability, which is particularly talking about um, paths, edges, nodes, districts, and landmarks. And then we'll be talking about a weird thing called psychogeography and uh, some crazy French guys who did a thing called La Derive um, and, and thought up the idea of psychogeography. Um, one of those things is probably very valuable to you and the other one perhaps less, but interesting. Um, in class, you'll be doing exercises uh, 17 and 18, which will be looking at the imageability concept and applying it first to a real place in Boston um, or your home city um, if, if you have a bunch of people from a different place. Um, and then uh, and we'll be applying it to a game uh, individually. Uh, and then you'll be working on an embedded, embedded narrative pattern uh, as a group, I believe. And then your project this week will be to uh, design a scene using the pattern that you create in exercise 19 um creating that scene in your editor recording your work as usual all right so imageability um this concept was articulated by kevin lynch in his book the image of the city he was very cranky about the current state of how cities are put together um and as an example for that look at these two pictures he looked at something like uh, the old city of paris and thought you know, I know how this city is laid out. I can I can imagine it easily in my mind. It's you know um, you know a, a circle bisected by the river with like the cathedral on the island and like laid out in you know more or less a grid within that area, divided into different districts. I know where things are. This is lovely, um, and Paris is a lovely city. So you know the Champs Elysees running down the the middle, opposite from the uh, Seine, the river um it's great and then he looked at something like boston and was like oh my gosh it's like somebody threw up spaghetti all over the map um what is what is this even good for um like i don't know where anything is now um after many years of living in boston i have an image of boston in my brain i you know bisect it by the river and uh by 93 and circle it with 95 and imagine where the different places that I know are. And, you know, I have I have a layout. Now, my layout isn't geographically accurate. The way that I imagine the city, the way that I store it in my brain isn't particularly true. Um, but it's necessary to organize the city in that way if you want to be able to, you know, remember where things are. This relates back to the uh, mind palace kind of idea in terms of how do we organize information in, in our brain. Um, I have an image of Boston in my head that uh, is useful. So um, he was trying to figure out, you know, if if I like how Paris is light, laid out, but I don't like how Boston or uh, Brooklyn or, you know, um, different, more modern cities are laid out, uh, why and how can I describe the ways that one works and the other doesn't? Um, and he came up with the ideas of, that things that make the city more imageable, easier to create that mental picture of and thus easier to use and interface with, right? Um, that there are affordances in terms of the way city is designed that can help you with that. Um, and so some of those are paths, which he say, says are things like roads or public transportation or canals, if canals are actually used for transport. So to some degree in Amsterdam, um, you know, canals might actually be paths, whereas in Boston, most of the waterways are not paths, right? We don't actually travel on them unless you're racing in the head of the Charles. Um, they're, they're less of a, of a path. Um, edges, which are shores 
boundaries between different neighborhoods, uh, walls are all edges. So in, in Boston, the Charles or the Mystic River, those are edges, they're div uh, dividing points. Um, you know, the divisions between Somerville and Cambridge, right? Like those, those uh, boundaries between those neighborhoods um, are, um, are edges. Um, and then physical, physical edges, right? Like an extreme case would be the Berlin Wall, but you know, any kind of a, of a wall can be an edge. Um, so, um, and in our case, things like major non-crossable highways, uh, he was sort of writing before that was a, a thing, but uh, you know, for us, 93 would be an edge as well as a path because you, you can't cross it if, unless you're actually driving on it. Um, so yeah. Let's see. And then um, nodes are specific places within that uh, within that map. So, you know, Northeastern would be a node within the uh, imaged city of Boston, um, as would, you know, Davis Square um, or, you know, the Middle East uh, Club. Like those are all going to be nodes within within the city. Districts or areas, you know, so for Boston, you know, we're divided up into a bunch of sub cities, but you know, whether it's Beacon Hill or Brookline or Dorchester or Somerville, right, all of those Cambridge are going to be districts within uh, the area, but also the theater district or the financial district, uh, you know, government center area um, are going to be districts. Um, Boston, you might think of those sometimes as, you know, the areas surrounding uh, T stations, right? Um, you might think of as a district. And then landmarks, specific, um, specific things that you use architectural weenies often to navigate around the city, things that you see and you know what they are. So, you know, in Europe, you have a lot of cathedrals are, you know, are going to be landmarks in the city, um, city gates, uh, large public monuments, you know, um, so all of those kind of things. In Boston, you might have things like the Sitco sign, um, you know, or any of the different uh, sports stadiums or uh, the Capitol building, right? Like that could both be a node and also a landmark. Um, so different bridges, you know, will be landmarks, things that you can, that you can navigate by and uh, organize all of those other things around, right? To give you context. So, um, that's all really useful and great if you're trying to think about cities, but what about games? Well, we need to image games too, right? We need to keep a map of the whole game in our mind. We need to keep a map of the level in our mind. Uh, we're talking about goals um, this week, you know, short, medium, long-term goals. We need to know where to go to pursue those. To do that, we need to have an image of the game in our mind. And games sometimes really bad at that. And so we have mini maps and we have separate map screens and you're constantly toggling back and forth between those to get around. And that isn't great for your immersion probably. So that makes, um, you know, that makes the game less effective. If you're swapping back and forth, then, then you're, you're not interacting with the game world naturally. Uh, if you're constantly watching your mini map to see where you're going, rather than actually looking at what's in the world, it's a missed opportunity. Um, and so these techniques, organizing your game world in a way that uh, it easily forms a picture in the mind of the player, means that they're going to have to look at the mini map less, that they're going to have to swap over to the other map to plot their course and check whether they've gotten lost less often. You have to spend more time immersed and focused on the game world. Um, and that's good. So, so this is useful for us in terms of game design. All right. So um, imaging, it's images all the way down. Um, you can image a city, right? You can imagine Boston, but you can also image, say, uh, the Northeastern campus. You, if you have actually been to campus, I hope you have, uh, and, and that you will again soon. But um, if you've been to the Northeastern campus, you have an idea of like, where's the student center? You know, where's the, where do the roads intersect it? Where's the T station? Where's, you know, Ryder Hall? Where are your classes? Where are your professor's offices? Where's your dorm? Where's your friend's dorm? Um, all of those places are in your mind. You know, where's the library? Where's the bookstore? Um, and um, you form a map of the city 
or map of the, the campus in this case, in the same way that you would form a map of Boston. Um, you have a map like that of your dorm if you're living on campus or of, you know, Ryder Hall if you if you have classes there a lot, um, or of the library if you've spent any time there not on the internet. Um, so, you know, it, those things scale down, they scale up too. You have a map in your mind of what the United States looks like, right? How accurate is it? Uh, you know, the places that you've spent a lot of time, probably more prominent on that map than they actually are uh, in reality. Your hometown might be some little town, but it, you know, in, in your mind, it takes up a big chunk of America. Um, but, uh, you know, you think of East Coast versus West Coast versus the Midwest versus the Southwest versus the South, you know, um, and uh, all of those different, you know, sort of geographic stereotypes that we have uh, are helping us place it. You know, we think of, you know, how do you get across the country? Well, you know, where are the uh, hubs where the airports are, where that you're going to fly through those things if you're flying across the country? You know, where are the roads that you're going to drive if you're doing that? Um, so, we, we image things, we make mental maps of locations um, and spatial, you know, spatial orientation at all different scales. And that's gonna work in a game too. Um, you want a given room or encounter to be imageable. You want the level to be imageable. You want the whole game to be imageable. So you need to think about that uh, on all different scales. Cool. Um, also, there are certainly patterns related to um, imaging and imaging spaces. And while we're not gonna do that exercise in class, you could certainly do a pattern exercise focused on uh, either any of the different aspects of imageability and where they show up in games, nodes, edges, all of that, you know, or on the concept of imageability across different games and see what things in games are the things that are different than nodes and edges and, and so on, um, you know, that, that are useful in games. So that's something you might want to think about. Okay. All right. Psychogeography. That totally sounds like a made up thing. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, it is, but um, there was in the 1950s, a avant-garde uh, French group that uh, came up with the idea of La Drive. They were um, rebelling against uh, a lot of structure and order uh, focused around architecture, um, you know, and the way that cities were built and organized. Uh, they were sort of rebelling against conformity in architecture and in behavior and saying that, like, the way that we use cities is oppressive. The way that we move through space is um, dictated by social forces that they found restrictive. And so they were like, we're going to move through the city in rebellious new ways. And what they did uh, was they're like, we're going to meet at this particular place at around this time. And then we're going to look around us and decide where we should go and then just go in that direction. So radical. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of going to ignore how you should normally traverse space. Uh, so, you know, we may be walking across lawns or through lobbies of hotels, or, you know, we're going to be like, oh, from this perspective, I have the way the buildings are shaped or, what, or whatever, you know, I have a, I'm compelled to move in this direction and walk to this, you know, this interesting visual component. And then I'm going to interact with a random person there and I'm going to go in another direction. Um, they were, very specific about how you should do it in terms of you should have at least three people, but no more than five people. Um, and then, um, you know, you, you wander through the world and interact with the world in whatever way is compelling to you. And you think about how you did that and how the city made you, uh, the architecture and the space and your mood and the people who you were talking to, how they shifted the way you move through the world. And, and you were going to, you know, reflect on that and have salons and think about it. Um, and they did that for, you know, a remarkably long time, like 20 years or something. Um, and uh, out of that school of thought uh, came this idea of psychogeography. Um, so Le Derive is this thing that I think is probably not terribly useful to you. Uh, it would be kind of a fun exercise if we were able to be in the world, be like, hey, everyone, get with your group and go outside right now and, and do that for half an hour and you know, tell me how you move through campus and why. And, you know, there would be lessons there. But um, more than that, 
the thing that they came up with was psychogeography. And that is the idea that your experience of a place changes as your, the meaning of that place changes for you. So uh, the example would be, you know, if you're, um, you know, going to the hospital for a checkup, that hospital has a certain meaning for you, right? It's like the place I go to get healthy, you know, and then to like make sure that I'm staying well. Um, you know, if you uh, watched your grandmother die in that hospital and you're going back to that hospital for a checkup, um, you have a different experience of that place, right? It now has this poignant emotional weight that, um, you know, that layers on top of your experience. So you feel differently about that space than you used to. Um, and so in terms of games, think about how a player's experience of a place in the game changes, particularly if they're going to be returning to a place multiple times. You know, you might have them start out in their hometown and it's this like friendly, safe place that they're, you know, they're, they're feel confident to set out into the world in. Later they come back and they watch, you know, um, their, their parents were killed by the invading army in front of them. And like, you know, this was a traumatic event. And then, you know, later in the game, they come back to the town. Their experience of the town that third time is very different than their experience the first time even if the town has recovered from the war and everything looks the same, their experience is different, even if the space hasn't actually changed. So think about what a player's experience of a space is um, when they're there in the game and if they're gonna be there multiple times, how that shifts over time. And then what can you do to encourage the kind of emotional response you want, right? Like if you want people to feel sad when they come back to their town, their hometown where their parents died, um, you know, maybe it doesn't look quite like it did before. And there are remnants of the war. There are things to remind them of that experience. If you want to shift them towards their happy moments, maybe, you know, you, you include or emphasize elements that were there in the first scene, but not in the second, so that they remember, you know, have a feeling of hope and rebirth or something uh, about the scene. So your, your job is not just to create a space, but to understand the player's experience and how that experience changes based on gameplay and interaction within that space. All right, so that is the lecture. Uh, to really quickly go over, we're gonna talk about the readings. This will be filled out um, more when you see it again, uh, but all of this stuff will be talked about in there. So there's a preview, you can make sure you have notes. Um, we're gonna do our show and tell as always. Exercise 17 is going to be imaging Boston. You're going to do that with your group. Uh, if you all are familiar with another city and want to image that city, that's fine. Um, you know, given that we've all been inside so much, this will be a little weird this time, but uh, we'll do it for Boston as a group. And then you're going to pick a game um, and you're going to try to image that game. Um, you probably want to sketch this out, uh, take a photo of that and, and add it to, um, to your readings and assignments documents in both cases. Uh, draw, you know, draw this map of, of the space. Don't try to be realistic with it. You know, just block out what you think the space of Boston looks like, where the locations that are important are, what the nodes uh, and edges and paths uh, and, and zones in the, or um, yeah, neighborhoods in the, uh, in the city are, and then do that for a game, either world or level that you're very familiar with. Um, the, you know, that you could actually draw the layout of. Like, what, what is the world of Breath of the Wild? How's that laid out? Without looking it up, don't do research here, right? Like, I'm not looking for you to um, find a map of Breath of the Wild and reproduce it for me, or to find a map of Boston and reproduce it for me. I'm looking for you all to show me what your your imaging of the city or the game are? How do you imagine it? And if you have a hard time imagining it, if you can't remember very many details of it, even though it's a level you loved and you spent lots of time in it, that may be because it wasn't very imageable, right? That they didn't do a good job of providing those different tools for you to use. Um, so you can't fail this by not being able to think of enough nodes in your game or enough nodes in Boston. Um, I just want you to, to put them together as close as you can. And, you know, don't worry about your accuracy. This is about like, you can't be inaccurate. This is 100% accurate to your mental map of the thing, whether or not that's accurate to the actual game or city. Cool. And then um, we'll talk about this in class, of course, but then we're going to do the embedded and environmental narrative pattern. Um, this one will be slightly different, and I'll talk about this in class because you're going to do uh, steps one through three alone 
and then steps four through eight together uh, after you together pick what the general narrative you're going to talk about is. And then we'll go over that again. Uh, again, pattern library uh, 233 is the example, and you can look that up in chapter nine if you wanna see uh, my work on that. Your assignments, as usual, will be to write one paragraph in response to the readings assignments um, for the week, or for the readings for the week, and then you need to finish up exercises 17 and 18, finish your uh, pattern for exercise 19, enter it into the library, and then do your uh, design as usual, implementing, um, trying to do more texturing and lighting, uh, trying to get more functional mechanics in to demonstrate the different parts of the, the level based on what you come up with um, in terms of uh, the pattern from exercise 19. All right, I will see everyone in class, um, whichever section you are in. Thank you for listening.